Good afternoon, uh, and thank you all again for coming to Kent Center Grand Rounds. We, we really have two uh, great talks, each uh, offering uh, uh, important perspectives on innovation in our center. Uh, and uh, just to get us started, our first speaker is, is Dr. Mark Saltzman. Mark, as you know, is the uh, Chair of Biomedical Engineering and Professor of Cellular and Molecular uh, Physiology and Chemical Engineering at Yale. He received his PhD, his doctorate from MIT, uh, was elected as a fellow of the American Institute of Bio Biological and Medical Engineers. Um, and as you, many of you are familiar, his, his work has really been as an innovator in uh, understanding, uh, basically understanding biology and designing new methods to, uh, to deliver uh, both therapeutic and preventive approaches uh, to cancer and, frankly, other diseases. Uh, and so his topic today is on polymer nanoparticles for treating cancer. And, and I know uh, it's, uh, this is an area that's uh, really important and appreciate, Mark, you sharing it. Thank you. I heard something. That's not a fire alarm, I assume. So. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, for that kind introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to uh, to be here, and uh, to be here meaning to be here to speak to you. It's a pleasure uh, for me to do that, but it's also a real uh, pleasure and honor to be part of this cancer center. And uh, as you can see, I'm going to talk about work with collaborators, many of whose names you'll recognize, who I met through the cancer center here, and they've uh, supported us uh, greatly in this work. So I'm very uh, appreciative of that. And um, I, I know I only have 25 minutes, and um, and I can only speak at a finite uh, rate, uh, but I, I couldn't resist the urge to put, uh, to put lots of things in because I, I, I'm excited about telling you about it. And so the title here is very uh, general, but I'll try to, I'll try to focus it uh, soon. And I also want to uh, start by, uh, by acknowledging the work of students and, and uh, fellows and postdocs who, who've uh, done the real important work on all these projects, and I'll try to acknowledge their contributions as I, as I go. So just briefly, uh, financial disclosures. Uh, the One of these that's most directly relevant to what I'll talk about today is, is Stratify, which is a joint venture with uh, Michael Girardi. So uh, I'm going to talk about using uh, materials, polymer materials, to deliver drugs. And, and a lot of what I'll talk about, we've used a, a material that is uh, old-fashioned in the sense that it was developed uh, many decades ago. It has a long history of use in medicine. And that's uh, that's a copolymer. Of, uh, of lactic acid or lactide and glycolide. A PLGA is the common uh, acronym used to describe it. And it's the basis of vicryl sutures, which have been along for around, around for a long time, and they're, and, uh, and, um, and they're well known to be safe. And that's a, that's a really good motivation for using it as a material. If you're going to make a drug delivery system that you're going to deploy in, in humans, you'd like to know that the base material is safe. And uh, then the challenge is to make it effective. And the, the interesting thing about uh, PLGA is that over the years, engineers have used have learned how to mold this into all kinds of uh, devices. Uh, this, is a, this is a fiber, uh, but you can also make uh, a screw that can hold bone together. And the other advantage of this material is that it's degradable. 
because it's a polyester and the ester linkages between monomers are sensitive to water. They, will, they can be hydrolyzed and then uh, the material will degrade into lactic acid and glycolic acid. So at the end of the day, uh, the vicryl suture disappears and hopefully the tissue holds itself together at that point. And the same thing uh, with the bone screw. And so what, uh, what we and, and many others discovered how to do uh, almost two decades ago now was to make this uh, polymer into nanoparticles. And uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of nanoparticles that are loaded with active ingredients. And the active ingredient here is the uh, chemotherapy drug uh, camptothecin. And you can see the scale bar down here. If you went and analyzed this picture, the particles are about 100 nanometers or so in diameter. There's some distribution of sizes. Some are a little bit bigger. Some are a little bit smaller. But in general, they're all spherical. They have a smooth surface. And they're very small. They're about the size of a virus. So influenza virus is also 100 nanometers or so. Uh, these are not viruses. They're virus size. But they're made of all uh, synthetic uh, or materials and drugs. And they have interesting properties, which are well, well known. One is that the particles themselves are not toxic, and you can uh, inject them into tissues in animals, or you can uh, apply them in cell culture like this. And until you get to a very high concentration of particles, you see no change in cell viability. If you load these particles with drugs, and if you do it the right way, then the drugs will be slowly released from the particles during incubation in water. And this shows camptothecin release over a period of two weeks. If you apply those drug-loaded particles in cell cultures, uh, they'll have uh, activity. In this case, the activity due to camptothecin being released from the particles. And in fact, this is a dose response curve for camptothecin compared to camptothecin loaded nanoparticles. And the, you'll notice that curve is shifted uh, to the, uh, to the um, left here. Uh, it's more potent in the nanoparticles than it is on its own. And you can inject these uh, particles into tumors. And this is an injection directly into a tumor in the flank. And you arrest the growth of this tumor with a single injection here at day 10. These pharmacological properties seem to be due to the fact that the particles themselves are small enough to enter cells. And so you see in this picture of, uh, of cancer cells in culture, the green are nanoparticles, blue is the nucleus, uh, red is actin. And you could see, hopefully, when it was moving, that these green dots are inside the cell. They're, uh, they're inside the plasma membrane. And over time, they accumulate in the perinuclear space. And if they're releasing drug molecules, then you're actually delivering drug very close to its uh, site of action. So we've, we've, as I described, known how to make these kinds of particles for a long time. And the challenge is how to make them in a way that makes them appropriate for treating uh, diseases of interest. So we wrote this review article, uh, two postdocs, Chris Chang, Craig Tijan, and, uh, and uh, Denny uh, Sancier-Sawyer. Uh, we wrote it, published a couple of years ago in one of the uh, Nature Review uh, journals. And the central idea was that you needed, that one size doesn't fit all, that if you have a biological application of these particles, like treating a particular kind of, of uh, tumor, then you need to think about different considerations for each one. And those could have to do with timing of release or responsiveness with the, the surface properties of the particle or with how the drugs are administered. And so we wrote this encouraging a holistic approach to targeting disease with polymer nanoparticles. It had 150 references. It was a pretty long review article. I was very proud of it. Nature labels it opinion. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide. What I'm going to talk about today is how to, how to design and use these kinds of materials for local treatment of brain tumors. I'll try to leave you with the idea that it turns out that surface properties can enhance nanoparticle interactions with tumor cells and the tumor and microenvironment, that you can use these concepts outside the brain as well to treat extracranial tumors. And uh, one thing we focused on over the last uh, years is, is delivery of uh, nucleic acids, microRNAs, and anti-microRNAs, uh, for example. And so I'll give you a little uh, uh, hint about that. Start with treating brain tumors. I don't have to say uh, anything more in this room. You know that uh, glioblastoma is aggressive and difficult to treat despite very aggressive therapies, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. Uh, not, uh, patients don't survive for very long with the most high-grade uh, tumors. So we started thinking about this problem a long time ago when I was a faculty member at Johns Hopkins. I was lucky to work with a group of people led by Henry Brem, who's now uh, chief of neurosurgery there, and a pharmaceutical company called Guilford Pharmaceuticals. And the idea was to try to develop an implantable, this is a non-nano, this is about the size of a dime, but a device that slowly releases chemotherapy agents. And the chemotherapy agent here is BCNU, which at that time was the agent that was most often used to treat brain tumors. And this shows uh, in vitro results. If you drop this, uh, this dime-sized wafer into 
a test tube. It will slowly release BCNU over a period of several uh, weeks. The idea was to give this to surgeons as a tool. They would remove, they would resect a tumor, and then they would place these uh, wafers back in the surgical resection cavity where they would slowly release the agent over time and could therefore help control uh, local recurrence of disease. Uh, this is the results from the first uh, uh, clinical trial, the phase three clinical trial led by uh, Dr. Brem, where he saw a shift to the right in the survival curves. It was a placebo-controlled uh, uh, double-blinded uh, trial, a shift to the right in survival curves. When we presented this data to the FDA, it was this uh, increase in long-term survival that was most impressive to them and led to approval in 1996, and is still used in, uh, in uh, centers throughout the world. There have been a number of clinical trials since then. But the reason I'm showing you this is that as we designed and tested these materials, we, we identified a potential limitation of them. And this is a coronal section from a brain of a rat where we'd implanted uh, a, a wafer that contained radio-labeled BCNU. And this is many days after implantation. And we used autoradiography then to make a map of where drug concentration was inside the brain. And what we learned is you can deliver very high levels of drug locally to the brain. This red zone represents a concentration of BCNU near the solubility of BCNU in CSF. So these are very high levels, uh, unprecedented level, levels. But if you move away from the site of the implant, concentrations drop very rapidly. So, so one millimeter, two millimeters away from the implant site, you detect no drug, even by this very sensitive method. Diffusion doesn't carry very, drugs very far from a local implant. At the same time that we were developing this technique, there was a group groups around the world, but principally Ed Oldfield's group at NIH, another a neurosurgeon, who is developing an alternative approach called convection-enhanced delivery, where you put a catheter directly at the side of the brain that you want to treat, and you uh, infuse slowly under pressure. And that creates a fluid flow in the interstitial spaces of the brain that can carry drug that's dissolved in this fluid away from the catheter. And they showed, while we were only treating one to two millimeter zones around the implant, and the implant doesn't move, they could treat centimeter or even 10 centimeter size regions in a, in a, in a large animal, but with drug dissolved in water. So when you remove the catheter or turn off the flow, the drug disappears very rapidly. We had the advantage of long-term delivery with a single application. They had the advantage of wide distribution. So with uh, Joe Peepmeyer initially, and a terrific postdoc named uh, Zhang Bing Zhao, who's now on the faculty in uh, neurosurgery here, and now more recently with Ranjit Bindra in uh, therapeutic radiology, we started developing the idea that one could combine these two approaches by taking nanoparticles like the ones I've described, suspending them in a fluid, and infusing them by convection-enhanced delivery through a catheter stereotactically located in the brain. If you design the particles right, they should penetrate through the tissue with the fluid, so you'd have the same advantage of wide distribution that you do with, uh, with CED, but when you turn off the flow, the particles will now be distributed to the brain, and they'll release their agent over a period of time. So could you accomplish this? This shows the first, uh, our first test of it. This was from Andy Sawyer's uh, PhD thesis. Uh, we did it in rats. This is a 9L glioma in a rat. Uh, put, the, uh, put the catheter right back at the site where we introduced the tumor cells, infused either free drug, camptothecin, or nanoparticles loaded with, free, with camptothecin at two different doses. And what you see here is that uh, camptothecin by itself, the free drug does nothing, but nanoparticles, if it delivered at a significant enough dose, uh, led to about 30% survival. And if you look in these animals, you don't see any evidence of the tumor uh, remaining. So we were uh, we were uh, uh, very proud of ourselves until we looked inside the brain and found that the particles went nowhere. <laughs> they accumulated around the end of the catheter. They didn't percolate through the brain tissue the way that we had hypothesized. This is working like gliadel. You're making basically a little material right around this end of the catheter. It's not spreading out, but it still works because gliadel works in these animal models, about 30% survival as well. So the, if our hypothesis about how this works is true, then the, the solution to this problem is simple. If you want to make the particles penetrate, you got to make them smaller. Right? And, um, and this just shows that that's true. This is work from uh, Toro Patel, who is a, who is a neurosurgery uh, resident here, and uh, Zhang Bing Zhao, who I already mentioned. Uh, to go from this picture here, particles slightly larger than 100 nanometers to particles that are about 60 to 80 nanometers took about three years uh, of, of excellent work from both of them. It's, not, it, it's easy to make particles. It's not easy to make particles that have a lot of drug in them. 
and that release the drugs slowly over time. So there were challenges in doing this, but once we figured out how to make them smaller and make them resist aggregation by treating with uh, particular kinds of sugars, we found we could go from all the particles depositing around the end of the catheter to them being widely distributed throughout the hemisphere of the, of the brain. We call particles that have those properties brain penetrating particles, and we've analyzed their, uh, their penetration by a variety of methods using fluorescence microscopy and with Rich Carson and his group in the PET Center by putting uh, PET fluorophores on the particles and watching their distribution. By all these measures, the brain penetrating particles, the small ones, move farther. We've also uh, made a step in translation to larger animals. This is infusion into the brain of a pig using standard neurosurgical catheters. Uh, we can infuse over a period of time, and you see, uh, you see large quantities of particles, detectable amounts that have spread almost throughout the, the hemisphere of the pig uh, brain. If you load these particles with paclitaxel, this was our first test to see if distributing them farther would make them better, and it does. These are survival curves. These are immunocompromised rats that have a U87 human uh, glioma growing in the brain. Uh, they die less than 30 days without any treatment. Treatment with free drug is not very uh, effective. Treatment with standard nanoparticles that don't penetrate very far does better, and treatment with particles that penetrate through the tissue does even better than that. So if, if, if this technology works, and that suggests you go from trying to pick drugs to treat brain tumors that you, based on whether they pass through the blood-brain barrier or not, to being able to pick whatever you want to deliver, as long as you could package it in particles like this and you could infuse it into the brain. So to identify at least one way to figure out what would be good to deliver, uh, this is also from Zhang Beng Zhao and Toral Patel's work, uh, is to screen uh, glioma stem cells. So these are patient-derived stem cells uh, uh, or, or cancer initiating cells that were isolated from uh, patients, then put into a high throughput assay. A, we, they screened an FDA approved, a library of FDA approved drugs, almost 2,000 drugs. Based on criteria, they identified 32 that looked like they were going to be very potent at killing this difficult to kill cell population. One drug in particular, dithiazidine iodide, had a very uh, low IC50 in three different uh, glioma stem cell lines. They packaged them in nanoparticles. They delivered in one infusion of CED in this PDX model now. These are, these are uh, uh, rats that have these human uh, glioma stem cells infused into their brain at time zero here. We treated 10 days after infusion, and the animals that got the brain penetrating particles with this drug remarkably survived much longer than any other, uh, than any other animals. So evidence that this can work uh, and that you can identify a unique drugs that you can uh, deliver in this way. So what we've learned about these so far is that to, to be brain penetrating, our particles need to have certain properties. They need to be less than 100 nanometers by SEM or 130 nanometers by a, by a, a technique called dynamic light scattering. They have to not aggregate when suspended in artificial CSF. They have to be neutral or have a negative zeta potential, neutral or negative surface charge. And if they have those properties, they'll penetrate. And our experience to date is that you can load these with a wide variety of drugs, and they will be uh, variously effective. They're effective in a wide variety of, of animal models of intracranial uh, tumors, and that you can make different polymer chemistries. And I'll explain why you might want to do that in a few moments. I want to just take a minute to highlight the direction this is going, and this is work with Ranjit uh, Bindra, who I know many of you uh, know, um, and how you could translate this to clinical practice, how you could add on to the current, uh, the current uh, treatment of uh, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. Um, and one way to do that is to use the nanoparticles to deliver agents that sensitize drugs to, uh, to, uh, to uh, radiation. And VE822 is uh, formerly a vertex drug uh, that's an ATR inhibitor. Uh, we screened a lot of ATR inhibitors and found that we could make very nice nanoparticles out of VE822. The particles release a burst of VE822 and then release it slowly. If you infuse it into the brain, they will penetrate. Drug levels remain high for almost, uh, for over 10 days. You know, if you just inject the drug itself, it disappears after a day, less than 10% left. But 10% is still left after 10 days in our case. And that's important if you want to use these for radiation therapy, because radiation therapy is typically delivered in fractions over time. One infusion, you need drug levels to remain therapeutic over that period when you're going to be delivering the radiotherapy. 
So here's the design of the, of the preclinical study here. We, uh, we uh, put tumors in. We did CED to introduce the nanoparticles, then gave three fractions of radiotherapy. And you see that the animals that got this uh, treatment did much better than animals that uh, didn't get one of those elements. So, uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Binder and I are currently working with a, a company called Atrin that uh, develops, uh, has developed an even more potent uh, uh, radio sensitizer. And we're hoping that this can lead to uh, a, a new tool that physicians can use to extend the lives of uh, patients with uh, high-grade gliomas. So the, the particles aren't perfect, and we found that because we've infused particles into brains with tumors. And when you infuse them into brains with tumors, they tend to migrate or move through the tumor by in pathways that you couldn't predict ahead of time. Uh, so this is a U87 uh, tumor where Jenny uh, saucier sawyer had injected uh, particles right into the middle of the tumor. The particles are red. The tumor cells are green. You can see them tracking out one direction and sort of surrounding the outside of the tumor rather than penetrating through it. And a different profile with an RG2 tumor, a different kind of a tumor. So we know that the properties of the tumor itself are gonna be important in how you can apply this uh, therapy locally. So we started to look at different kinds of uh, polymer chemistries that would allow us to, uh, to, um, to uh, change the way that the particles interact with tumor cells in the tumor microenvironment. And one particular chemistry we discovered several years ago, this is work of Yang Deng, who is a postdoc here, was that the state-of-the-art particle for clinical trials of nanoparticles in, in uh, cancer are uh, PLA, a, a version of PLGA, with polyethylene glycol on the surface of the particle. And uh, that gives you a fairly long circulating half-life if you put these, if you inject these intravenously. Uh, Yang reasoned that if you could take a similar polyether highly uh, branched polyglycerol and attach that to the surface, it ought to give these particles a better stealth property because it would resist adsorption of proteins even better than polyethylene glycol does. And in fact, they circulate for longer. Less of the particles ends up in liver, more of it ends up in the tumor. These are flank tumors, so we're using uh, the circulation to deliver them to tumors. And uh, just two injections of these particles do much better at controlling a flank tumor growth than do the state-of-the-art particles that have been tested in clinical trials. So this is an interesting material. It's also interesting in another way that you can take its uh, chemical property, which is rich in hydroxyl groups on the outside, and that's what makes it very water compatible and resist protein adsorption, and you can convert it into a state where there's lots of aldehydes on the surface. And you do this by simple uh, incubation in sodium uh, uh, pyridate. And that gives the stealthy property particles the property that they become very sticky. That is, they adhere to proteins very well. And we've shown that by attaching particles to uh, protein layers in culture. If you just incubate these sticky particles over a protein layer, you can't wash them off any longer. And the same thing if you, uh, if you incubate them in cell culture. They stick to the cell surface so avidly that you can't wash them off. This is the basis of a, of a, of a, of, of a sunscreen that uh, Mike Girardi and I have developed. By putting uh, UV filters inside these sticky particles, you apply them to the skin and they stick and they don't wash off. I don't have time to talk about that one today, but, uh, but it works. Um, and, but it's given us a tool that we can use to try to explore how do different polymer surface chemistries change the fate of particles if you infuse them into brain tumors. So this is the work of Eric Song, who's now in the MD-PhD program here, and Alice Gowden, who was a postdoc. Uh, we made particles that were the same, except the surface changed. They were either plain, they had polyethylene glycol, they had HPG, or they had sticky HPG on the surface. They're all the same size. They have different surface properties. They look the same by, uh, by electron microscopy. They're stable when incubated in CSF, and they distribute in the brain. But if you infuse them into a brain with a tumor, you see something very different. And that's shown by these pie charts here. So we in infused them, took out the brain, dissociated the single cells, did flow cytometry to identify what fraction of the nanoparticles were in each cell population compartment. So red is tumor cells, uh, blue is microglia, yellow is astrocytes, and, and green is neurons. The size of the pie chart tells you how many particles ended up in cells many more in the case of the sticky nanoparticles. And of the ones that end up in cells, a greater fraction of them end up in tumor cells when they're sticky compared to if they're stealthy or they have in these other modes. And this, uh, this correlation between the fraction of nanoparticles that end up in tumor cells uh, allows you to predict the effectiveness of these different chemistries in delivering drugs in the brain. <clears throat> 
I have one minute <laughs> and lots of slides. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, quickly say that we've, uh, you can use these in treating uh, tumors outside the brain. These are sticky particles that are injected IP to deliver apophyllone B in uh, tumors. This is a collaboration with Alessandro Santin. So these are u uterine serous tumors that he's, uh, that he's collected from patients, injected interperitoneally. They will grow, and the animal will eventually die from disseminated uh, from disseminated tumors in the, in the uh, peritoneal space. Uh, if you inject these sticky particles interperitoneally, compare them to stealthy particles, the stealthy ones disappear within a day, and the sticky ones stay around for five days. And that retention at the site of uh, tumor growth uh, gives them a, a remarkably better property in increasing the survival of these animals. I, w I wanted to talk a little bit about using the same technology to deliver um, uh, microRNAs and anti-microRNAs. I don't have time to do that. I'll point out some early work with Frank, Frank Slack, a former cancer center uh, member, where we used his lymphoma model to deliver uh, anti-MIR 155, uh, either directly injected into tumors and the tumor disappears, or injected systemically and growth of the tumor is significantly slowed down. Uh, our limit here was how much, uh, how much we could afford to make these nanoparticles, because the problem with PLGA is that it's not very efficient for loading of nucleic acids or nucleic acid analogs. And you could do it. We showed you could do it here. Uh, but, uh, but the process of making the nanoparticles was so inefficient that it was just prohibitively expensive to do any more experiments. So we developed a new material. And um, it's a tur polymer of amines and esters. And, um, and it's a very tunable polymer. And it, it has uh, an ionizable group on this amine-containing uh, monomer. So this becomes positively charged at neutral pH and allows it to interact electrostatically with nucleic acids. And because of that, you can easily load higher concentrations of nucleic acids into these kinds of materials. Our first demonstration that this was useful was delivering plasmid uh, DNA that encoded for trail in, um, uh, in systemically injected and they accumulate in, in uh, uh, flank tumors and lead to uh, growth delay. I'll just say that at this point we can load plasma DNA in these particles, microRNAs, siRNAs, messenger RNAs, and we've shown that the materials are quite tunable and that you can make them uh, in a variety of different chemistries, all with this property of being able to load nucleic acids very efficiently. And I think I'll... Um, Stop there, except to say that Young Sal, who is defending her PhD thesis in uh, a few months, has learned how to make these into uh, nanoparticles, very reproducible for delivering an anti-microRNA uh, to uh, MIR-21. These particles will uh, uh, readily accumulate intracellularly, releasing the anti-MIR, knocking down the MIR activity. Uh, they, you can make them stable. You can infuse them in the brain, and they appear to have interesting properties in terms of, uh, of uh, particularly as you use as adjuvants uh, for uh, conventional chemotherapy uh, like uh, temozolomide. So I'll stop uh, engineering of polymer nanoparticles for sustained release of agents. I tried to show you about that. Talked about brain penetrating nanoparticles and how new kinds of materials that have never been used in medicine before might make it possible to deliver uh, agents that uh, we would like to be able to use for therapies. Thanks. Mark, thank you. It's an impressive body of work. Is there a way to further design these particles so that you can create almost a homing mechanism for them to, to go to the right place to, to, to a tumor? For example? Yeah, so the, the, the question is about could you, could you add a mechanism for homing? And, and we've, we've been working with um, uh, a lot of different approaches, antibodies, for example. And with Jordan Pober, we've developed uh, particles that will home to endothelial cells. Um, the most interesting thing for, in, our, in, in, in my view, is this peptide called FLIP that Don Engelman and his colleagues have developed that uh, undergoes a, a, a phase transition at uh, low pH. And, um, and we published a paper with Frank Slack and Peter Glazer and Don Engelman uh, in Nature a couple of years ago showing you could conjugate molecules to FLIP, antimeres to FLIP, and they would accumulate preferentially in tumors. And we've done a little bit further putting this FLIP on the surface of nanoparticles, and that allows them to accumulate sort of selectively in tumors as well, in tumors where you have mild uh, acidity. So that that's, I think, is the most promising approach for doing that kind of homing. <laughs>
So I've showed you both. I've shown you very hydrophobic compounds like paclitaxel and camptothecin and other drugs. Uh, but I've also shown you very hydrophilic compounds like, like uh, nucleic acids. So it's, it, it's not easy and uh, not one approach will work with all. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, people have tried to make correlations using things like log P, hydrophilicity scale. Uh, it doesn't always work like you think it's going to work. So there's, um, there's, uh, there's still some art here in, uh, in uh, but I, I've tried to show there's some science as well that if you design a particle, if you design a material that can interact with your hydrophilic, in this case, electrostatically interact with nucleic acids, you can make it work. So we, we've published papers on all of those things. So uh, self-penetrating peptides, we've pr published a number of papers on using them for local, local enhancement of uptake. It works. Yeah. Um, does your nanoparticle allow loading of mixture material, like if the drug combines, or drug plus nuclear enhancement? Yes. The, the, the question is, can you load combinations of materials? And the answer is yes. The, the, the challenge is how to do that, because typically I didn't talk at all about the process of making these. Usually the process depends on the properties of the molecule, and if the properties of the molecules are very different, you can't use the same process simultaneously. So you have to get cl either clever or lucky <laughs> um, uh, in order to make it work. But, um, but I think that's a huge opportunity for the future, because delivering combinations. Uh, now, you could argue. You don't need to deliver a combination in one nanoparticle. Why not just make two nanoparticles that are made by different processes that each have a different drug in them? And that might be a more practical way to do it. One more thank you. Sure. Thank you.